Hey everybody, so March is over and it's time to wrap up my March reading. It was a pretty dang good reading month. So many fantastic books. And I think two of my favorite reads of the year may have happened in March and I cannot wait to tell you all about them. So let's get started. Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Russell with Ink and Paper Blog. How are you all doing today? As always, I hope you're happy, I hope you're healthy, I hope you're safe, and of course I hope you're reading an amazing book or two or three or four. Um, it is a gorgeous day in Northern California. It is in the low 70s, the sun is out, it's got a slight breeze. It was dog walking weather, it's reading weather, it is just, it is pitch perfect today, so I cannot complain. And I, you know, I cannot complain about my March reading either. It was actually a very, very good month for me. And I cannot wait to tell you about all these books. I'm going to say maybe two of my favorite books that will end up on my year-end list, if I'm not mistaken. So get out your pen, get out your paper, get out your Goodreads, however you keep track of your TBR. If you are so able, please order these books from your local independent bookstore. Or if you are a library user, get your library to get you a copy as soon as possible. So I'm going to start with my sort of rave reviews of this month because these are just two books that blew me away. And I want to make sure that I give them their due and talk about them as much as possible. The first book that I want to talk about is Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. Now, Douglas Stewart does not need an introduction from me, right? Shuggy Bain, his uh, debut novel was everywhere. It won the Booker Prize. It was shortlisted for the National Book Award. Um, and it was everything for quite some time in the bookish world. So Douglas Stewart needs no introduction. Now, if you have been a fan of my channel for a while, you'll know I really enjoyed Shuggy Bane, but I was not as in love with it as everyone else was. I thought it was a fantastic debut novel. It had a lot of depth, a lot of heart. Um, I just wanted a little bit more. And then this happened. This is a masterpiece. Um, I don't even know really how to start talking about it, but... Um, this book is the story of Mungo. He is a young boy. He is the youngest of three children. His mother is often gone, and when she is home, she is awful and often drunk. Um, his father died when he was very, um, actually before he was born, and um, so he has always sort of been raised by his older sister. Um, every character in this book has such an interesting arc. So we'll start. The oldest brother is, so they're a Protestant family. The oldest brother is sort of like the leader of the neighborhood Protestant gang and involved in that war um, between the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, his sister is working hard, bringing money into the family, supporting, but also has sort of goals and aspirations beyond her family, beyond sort of what is expected from her. And then there's Mungo. He is very attached to his mother, he always sort of forgives everything that she does. And he is also, you know, more sensitive, more, you know, more um, introverted than everyone else in his family. Um, he winds up meeting a young, another young boy who is Catholic, and they, of course, um, start a friendship that goes down and becomes a relationship. Now that has repercussions. What this book does really, really well is it jumps between uh, a current sort of time period. Um, something has been found out. Uh, Mungo has been sent on this um, trip with uh, these two people who are, these two men who are in AAA. AAA. If you're in America, you get that. In AA. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, in AA, for Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, with their mom, uh, they take him on this trip to sort of man him up, which that whole thing, it's the first part of the book um, where it starts, and it is so ominous and dark and perfectly written. Um, and then it flashes back, and we get sort of like this story of the two worlds as they come together, the, the past and the present. Um, I will say there's some trigger warnings for sexual abuse. There's trigger warnings for just mental and, mental and physical abuse of children. Um, but this book is beautifully written. Every character is so three-dimensional, even the people who are clearly sort of secondary to the narrative 
They just, they really are so fleshed out. And one thing about Shuggy Bane that, um, one of my things that I just felt, I didn't feel in Shuggy Bane that the city of Glasgow was as much of a character as I wanted it to be. That is not the same. I just felt like Douglas Stewart's idea of place was so much stronger in this book and so much more part of the overall narrative. Um, I, I can't say, there's very little to say um, that is not a rave for me. I think this book is pretty darn brilliant. Um, so this is Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. This comes out, it, so it's out in the U.S. kind of. It technically doesn't come out until the next week, but I've seen a lot of people in America get their copies already. Um, but this is out from Grove in the U.S. I don't know who the, is publishing it in the U.K., but we'll all be able to have it very, very soon. Um, and I adored it. I'm hoping that I'll be able to see Douglas Stewart. He's actually coming to the Bay Area um, around my birthday. So I am trying very hard to sort of schedule that. Tickets are going to be very difficult. So I'm going to try my darndest. Um, but um, yeah, no, Young Mungo, it is a work of art. The next book I want to tell you about is a little bit different, but in the same way, I think utterly brilliant. And that's The Last Confessions of Sylvia P. by Lee Kravitz. This just came out here in the U.S. Um, from Harper. Uh, Sylvia P. is the amazing Sylvia Plath. This book centers around her and her creation of her famous novel, The Bell Jar. Told from three different perspectives, the book is told from sort of a modern day perspective um, from a woman who works at an auction um, house where two men who flip homes have found these journals, handwritten notebooks that appear to be sort of like a rough draft of the bell jar. They bring them in with the high, the, this idea of auctioning them off. The other sec, the middle section is told from the point of view of another poet, a rival of Sylvia's, and a woman who is writing sort of a confessionary letter to her mentor, uh, Robert Lowell, who is a very famous poet of himself, um, and talks about sort of their dynamic in, in this writing group that she and Sylvia Plath were a part of. The third perspective is from a doctor at a psychiatric facility who... Um, works with Sylvia and sort of the um, relationship and the different ways she tries to help Sylvia with her suicidal thoughts, and her depression, and all of that. And all of those sort of come together. Um, I This book is almost thriller-esque in nature to me. I was flipping the pages as quickly as I could. I wanted to know how it came together. And for a book where Sylvia Plath never has her own perspective, she is the bright shining star at the center. Um, and the brilliance of her sort of infuses all the other narratives in such a clever and just overall well-done way that um, I think it is, I think this is a debut novel and it is really, really good. Um, yeah, and I absolutely loved it. I highly recommend it. So that's The Last Confessions of Sylvia P. by Lee Kravitz. And this is out now from Harper. You can get your hands on it. I need to, I do need to get myself a finished copy of that one. That one needs to go on the shelf. Okay, those were like rave, rave reviews. They were so fantastic. But that doesn't mean the rest of these books aren't fantastic too because I absolutely loved a lot of them. So yeah, it was a good reading month, I have to tell you. But I decided after reading some other stuff that I wanted to read something sort of fantasy. So I picked up um, A Taste, uh, uh, I'm sorry, A Taste of Gold and Iron by Alexandra Rowland out from Tor.com. And this comes out in June. So this one's around the, the corner, just not that far away, let's be honest. Um, and so this is one of those political fantasies sort of set in a different world. Um, but it's sort of light fantasy. It's more just more of a medieval type of feel to it. Um, at the start of the book, we're introduced to our main character. We have two main characters. Um, Kado is, is how I said his name, K-A-D-O-U. I'm not sure if that's how the author would pronounce it. Um, is a prince. He is sort of relieved at the start of the book because 
his sister, who is the Sultan, has just had a child. He does not want to be in charge of the kingdom, so he's ecstatic. Um, but something had happened. And um, while she was um, giving birth, that he becomes involved in this sort of mystery um, theft that occurs. And um, he gets in a confrontation with the father of his sister's child. Um, what winds up happening is that he very, very at the beginning, I'm not spoiling anything, something occurs and he sort of gets put to the side because um, he, his sister originally was going to like sort of almost banish him, but he stays around. He gets a new um, personal guard who is this fresh recruit, very dedicated to the way things are supposed to be. And um, yeah, it goes from there. This book is part queer romance. This part, this book is part political thriller. This part, is, this book is part family drama. Um, and it is everything exactly as it needs to be. I will say like about one third of the way into it, it gets a little bit slowed down because the characters are really trying to figure out their voices. And the prince, I'm going to say this right now, the prince is rather whiny at the start. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to deal with it. But as um, Alexandra sort of develops him as a character, it all starts to make sense. So give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, the romance is absolutely like, you know it's coming, but you just want it to because it's just so good. Um, and really for me, that was really the heart of this book and the part that I loved the most. But overall, I enjoyed it. I cannot wait to see what she does next. I would totally go back to this world and this char these characters. And so that's A Taste of Gold and Iron by Alexandra Roland. And this comes out in June from Tor.com. Hopefully I did a good... Sometimes when I'm like describing just like, you know, epic fantasy or political fantasy or whatever, I feel like if I say too much, I'll ruin the plot. And I, I don't want to do that. But that one is worth reading. Promise me. Promise you. Promise you. Um, the next book that I want to talk about is uh, Julie Otsuka's the Swimmers. Um, mo you know, she's known for The Buddha and the Addict. Um, she is Addict. Um, and uh, she's a fantastic writer. Her books are all very slim and very sort of um, philosophical in nature. Um, and this book centers around a city swimming pool that's sort of underground and the people who attend it. And one day these cracks start appearing in the swimming pool and how that sort of affects the dynamic of really a bunch of different people's lives. Um, here's what I'm going to say about this book. In the beginning, when it was sort of a step back, sort of observational, philosophical undertaking of how this pool, pool fit in everybody's world, I was, I was in. I thought it was so beautifully written. I really liked it sort of the standoffishness of the narration. And I liked sort of the, um, I don't know, the observations that she was making. Once it starts to get a little bit more character driven, the book lost me a little bit. I mean, I liked it. I just thought the first part of it was so much more. And um, I could have read sort of that perspective throughout the whole narrative. Um, I think she's a beautiful writer. She has such a turn of phrase. Her books are short, but they punch with so much power. Um, I just think that for this one, for me, it was sort of a tale of two different types of story. And I just enjoyed the first half much more than the second, but I would recommend it highly. I think she's an amazing writer. So that's Julie Ots uh, Otsuka's The Swimmers out now from Knopf. And if you haven't read all her other books, you really should. You really should. Okay. Um, another author that I am absolutely have, all, I've read everything she's written, I do believe. And so I was so excited to get my hands on Booth by Karen Joy Fowler. Now, I will say we all, um, we are all completely beside ourselves. The Jane Austen Society um, are two of my favorite books. I I'm so terrible with titles. I want to make sure what's the other one I love by her. Um, Oh, Wit's End. Love Wit's End. Okay, so Booth is the story of the family of John Wilkes Booth, told from the perspective of his three of his siblings. I think there were ten in all, if I recall. Um, but 
we learn a lot about his family. His father was a very famous actor in his time, and he, um, but he was also a raging alcoholic and often destroyed sort of his reputation because of that. We learn about, you know, how the family went from poverty to this, uh, in the, in sort of the, um, how do I want to say this? So they start off sort of well-to-do because the father is very successful. They build this house out in the country. They wind up losing sort of that status and the father is sort of wasting away the family fortune and they move to the city and all of that dynamic. We get very little actually from the point of view of John Wilkes Booth himself. It is really a family story um, and it takes place over quite a bit of time. Um, but here's my thing. This book was almost too well researched in regards to there was a lot of detail that I didn't feel like moved the narrative along. And the historical piece to sort of get you grounded of where we were at the time is almost passing. Like it didn't really add anything. It would be like a couple pages or a sentence or something like that. And I was just like, I don't know why. Like if you took that out, I don't know that this book had a, a center that would have told you where it was. And I don't know that the Booth family was important enough to um, drive that message home. I think Karen Joy Fowler is a fantastic writer and I think she writes amazing sentences. And I know she was very, you can tell her passion for this project in this book. It just didn't quite work all the way through for me. Um, I think it's a, it's a fine book. I would recommend it if you're really into sort of historical fiction based upon the lives of people who have really changed the, the dynamic of the, the state history or the United States history. Um, but I think her other books just have had a little more oomph to me. But I think she's fantastic and she's a lovely, lovely person. I've met her, um, talked to her, and she is great. So this is Karen Joy Fowler's Booth out now from Putnam. Okay, last but not least is a series of graphic novels that my friend Ryan lent me. Um, there are four uh, um, editions and it's Fence. It is written by C.S. Picat um, and I think it's Illustrated by Johanna the Mad and Johanna the Mad and Joanna La Fuente. Um, I, I should probably, they're all um, named on the cover. I thought they were illustrators, but you know, just making sure. Um, all I will say is this is the story of a young boy who wants to be, who is um, driven to be a fencer. Uh, a fencer? Is that what that word is? He wants to fence. Um, he is the illegitimate unknown son of this world famous person who won a gold medal fencing. He winds up um, going to a tournament and losing to this astronomically talented guy. And they wind up at the same school and they are competing to be on the school fencing team. It is everything you want. It's got a little bit of like the drama of high school politics. It's got um, sports drama regarding like, are we going to win? Who's going to lose? You know, and even though you're like watching two people fence on the page and it's not you know, it's just so well done that you really feel like you're there and you're involved in sort of the back and forth of it all. It's also about friendship and teenage relationships and all of that kind of stuff. And it's it's just really, really, really fun. Um, it ended, I guess, rather abruptly. We don't really know after the four. I don't think there's any... Um, intention of continuing the series. I do know that there are two sort of novelizations that continue the series going forward, but the, it just, it was super, super fun. I thank you, Ryan, for lending it to me. The art is really, really good too. Like I'll just hold this up for you. It's just really, really good. It's diverse. It has much, many, many different types of representation in it. And um, I read it all. It was a Saturday morning. It was lovely. And I totally, totally enjoyed it. So this is Fence by C.S. Picat, Johanna the Mad, and Joanna La Fuente. Um, and this is all out from Boombox. And I loved it. So let's see if I can hold all of these up for you and say that's a wrap up of my March reading. Um, two, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to say this. Two books that I think everyone should read. They're so fantastic. A fantasy um, romance political thing that I cannot, cannot stop thinking about. Two masters of the literary form who I really think are fantastic writers 
good books, not my favorite by them, but also, you know, that just could be me. You could absolutely love them. And a graphic novel series that I tell you not, I loved and read quickly. If you are a return subscriber to my channel, I could not do this without you. Thank you so very, very much. If you are new to my channel, thank you for coming by. I hope you hit that subscribe, that little button, do all of that. As always, I encourage you to read globally, shop locally, and until next time, I wish you happy reading. Bye, everyone.